now. And uh, so uh, we are delighted to have um, three parent leaders with us, three, three visionaries. I'm not going to say a lot about them. I really want you to hear from them and not from me. But immediately to my left is Nora Thompson, who serves as executive director of Matrix, a multi-county parent center in Northern California. And on her left is Connie Hawkins, who serves as executive director of ECAC, the statewide parent center for North Carolina. Both Nora and Connie serve as directors of regional parent technical assistance centers, designated by the US Department of Education to provide technical assistance to other parent centers in their regions. And to Connie's left is Marshall. <laughs> So we're going to kind of have a conversation here, and hopefully you might need to bring the mics closer to you. So uh, I'm going to just start. We'll kind of work our way down. And the, the first uh, question is, what do you wish you knew 20 or 30 years ago that you, that you know now? Okay. As... Oh, too bad. Okay. There. What do I wish I knew then that I know now? Um, First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about my story, and I am the parent of four children, uh, and one of my children, my third child, Kate, had severe profound disabilities, and that started me on a journey that I felt completely unprepared for, and um, it was 1984, so it was 31 years ago, and what I wish I would have known then that I know now um, is everything will take longer than you think it will, everything, and that there are amazing supports and people out there that will have powerful, powerful impact on what you do and how you proceed. The trick is finding them because it's, it's really challenging to do that. And that a different life than what I thought can be a great life. Mm -hmm. ah, Nora just handed me this. I think I might have done a little things differently if I'd had any vision that 30 years, 30 years ago that I was going to turn into the fat old lady with dyed red hair that was, you guys were all listening to get some advice from. <laughs> just wasn't my vision of my life, okay? Just want you all to know that. <laughs> um, I think the one thing... Um, that was probably the most frustrating and the hardest to get was that some questions will never be answered. You know, that, you know, you know, why do I have this wonderful six foot, five inch, 270 pound unique guy <laughs> who came out at 10 pounds, 12 ounces. So he's always been the big guy, you know, with the flaps, <laughs> you know. Um, why did the school look at me like I was a little crazy when I showed up to kindergarten? Uh, because that was 1980, so the law had the North Carolina law was two years old, and he wasn't, um, um, didn't have in intellectual disabilities, wasn't in a wheelchair, wasn't deaf, wasn't blind, so they didn't know what to do with him. Um, just all of those whys, you know, uh, why did that teacher not particularly think he was a great student? Uh, all the whys. And um, there, there are no answers. We've all got the answers, and we just have to get to them. So I think the thing I would like to have started out with was not – not having to spend half of my life worrying about why I didn't know things. You know, just just go forward. Is there, is, is, we, is, is there a problem with that, Mike? Did we I give you, it's like right. the candle that won't blow out yeah, on your birthday? We, we couldn't get it to go. Here, I'll give it a try. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, I put together these this bulleted list, and uh, I think that probably as I look at the list, the thing that uh, that's, uh, maybe stands out most strongly for me right now is that is that when, I, when I'm wrong, I uh, try to promptly admit it and apologize. I, um, I've spent enormous amounts of time churning about ways that I wished I'd handled something and ways that I mistreated people. And so it's for me this, uh, this kind of an enduring, uh, enduring, you know, quickly tell people you're sorry and apologize when you, uh, when you go off track. I, I have a couple of other things I'd say really fast. Everything doesn't have to be a fight. Um, that don't take yourself too seriously. Um, take care of yourself. Uh, make friends before you need them. And then before, uh, for those of you who are in the session uh, that I was a part of before this, uh, reinforce desired behavior. And I think 
we said we're going to do whys on the way back up, too. Uh, one of the things that I think for me was also um, um, something I wish I'd known is that there were no quick fixes. And um, the doctor who tried to convince me there were was totally crazy. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, you think about what families get told and we think about what teachers get told. You know, the, the, new, the new effective based practice, who, I mean, evidence-based practice is going to fix everything. Um, and I think, I think it's a real struggle to not start believing some of that, that it's going to happen. The other thing, you know, being up here as a parent leader is yeah. not a mantle I wear very easily. I really do feel like most of the time I have stumbled through and fumbled through um, and found myself in places I never thought I would be um, with, with a lot of discomfort but finding a lot of joy and reward there. And it... I always viewed the idea of a, of, of a parent leader or even a lot of adult behavior is folks that had a very clear path and a very clear plan and just move forward. And my experience in so many things, not just raising my daughter um, and my other children, um, was just fumble and stumble and how the hell did I get here? The other thing um, I wanted to say is that until this experience, I really did think that really important ideas came out of the really important idea factory that was staffed by the really smart people, and that is not the case either. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. All right. Do you want to add anything? Add anything? Okay. okay. Um, maybe we'll start down with Marshall uh, with this question. How have things changed, in particular, mm -hmm. what has gotten worse and what has gotten better? Well, in thinking about what's gotten worse, you know, uh, school funding has gotten worse. I think about here in Oregon, uh, where uh, we are now once, I mean, coming from an extraordinarily proud tradition of public education, I think we're currently ranked 46th in the country. Um, and, you know, on a daily basis, folks who work in our schools are aware of um, how severely that has reduced our capacity to deliver the kind of education we want to. And it um, that's playing out all across the country. I shudder to think that anybody could be funded at a lower level than we are. Oh, and California. California. Uh, that's right. Uh, so I'm shuddering. Let's not get competitive <laughs> over that. Um, and yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It, uh, I'm from North Carolina, the 50th in the country. So. And, <laughs> and I, I, have, I have no doubt that the places that have, uh, that are at the top, still experience a shortage of, of resources on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think that the educational opportunities for students who we would consider disenfranchised, students of color, um, students who, are, who come from economically stressed backgrounds, that it's gotten worse, that, um, that in spite of, uh, of considerable national attention, that if you look at the data, you know, the probability that a, uh, a black student in this country will be suspended, will be expelled, will um, be placed in special education, uh, that they will be, um, uh, the likelihood that they will drop out, the reduced likelihood that they will be identified as TAG. I mean, the data is, um, is incontrovertible and it doesn't change. Um, and, and alongside that, we've seen a narrowing of the middle class. And so we have some people in this country who have extraordinary opportunities, can buy their way into anything that they want. And we have an awful lot of people who are in a day-to-day -day struggle uh, just to make ends meet. So I think, I think that's what's gotten worse. You know, I think what's gotten better is that there's been a really profound shift in terms of our um, the tactics we were talking at lunch, um, our commitment to collaboration. I brought this... Uh, Mothers from Hell, uh, you know, was an organization that was founded here in Eugene. In fact, I'm, I'm proud to say that the first sheet of letterhead that Mothers from Hell had was to write a letter of support for a grant application that uh, that I was submitting. It's my understanding that that letter was copied and distributed around the Department of Education, much to a lot of people's amusement. You know, there are still Mothers from Hell, and there still continue to be um, extraordinarily egregious offenses that uh, that require that kind of a of a pushback. But I think in general we've we've moved into a more civil time. Um, we 
uh, we have better technology. Technology is blowing the doors off of possibilities. Um, we have, I think, better health care and broader access to health care. We have shifting attitudes about people with disabilities. So I think that in many ways things are have gotten much better. Um, I think things have gotten better because we had the opportunity to hear Amelia this morning. Hmm. You know, that would not have happened 30 years ago. Um, I think one of the things is I th as a parent movement and I think as a professional um, skills uh, for educators, we've figured out the importance of people skills and we've figured out the importance of, of negotiating. Um, I live near a large university that has a large special ed and regular ed um, um, teacher prep program. And I, you know, 20 years ago, I would get called and said, would you please come talk to our students about dealing with parents? And I went, nope. <laughs> if all you're going to do is deal with me, I'm not going to come talk to you. And I think we have figured out there's a, a little more to this relationship than dealing with each other. Um, I don't think we have figured out quite effectively um, that we're not two different sides. Um, and I think that's even true in the disability groups and even the parent movement sometimes when it comes with disabilities, you know, that the families of autism well, kids with autism may say, I'm going for this, and the kids, parents of kids with, with learning disabilities will be going a different direction. Um, I think it is, um, I think we have great language around inclusion. We haven't figured out that real inclusion doesn't take a plan and a team and <laughs> that we just, take kids to school <laughs> and figure it out. Um, I think effective-based practices are great, and we know wonderful things to do, and we know wonderful procedures. Um, I think today some of those are taking away from individualization that some kids need. Uh, because it's a little hard to um, go that part of the protocol doesn't work for this kid. Um, so I think we have some challenges there. Um, I think all in all, um, um, it depends on the day, the school, <laughs> the money, uh, the culture, um, and unfairly the background of the parents and the willingness of the parents to be included in the in the building and the building's willing willingness to to do what they have to do to modify and accommodate what that parent needs to be included so i approach this question more from um, the experience of running the parent center and, and the calls that we get and the i look at it at the landscape with you all today, and I see a wide variety of ages, but I also see a lot of folks that look a lot like me. And um, the the way information is delivered now versus back in my day mm -hmm. is is night and day. Mm -hmm. um, when parents came to us originally, we were the only real source of information around specific disabilities mm -hmm. and trainings on IEPs and understanding the law. And those were a series of trainings, an hour or two hours a day for six weeks. And you took that course more than once just to have it sink in. Now the families that we work with want bite-sized chunks, their IEP is next week, they need to know what they need to know about just this piece. The context of the law and the processes and making sure they have a good foundation is a much more challenging, it's much more challenging to deliver that um, with how, what the families are asking us. Um, the families coming to us now are digital natives. Right. I mean, they can go online and get information about just about anything. And they generally come to us after they've exhausted all of that. Mm -hmm. So consequently, the calls that we take in the parent centers are families that have multiple, yeah. 
multiple issues. Their kid may be in juvenile justice, mental health. Um, uh, they're they're having their you know the IEP is just one piece of a really messy picture, mm -hmm. and sorting all of that out and a lot of other agencies and supports that are supposed to be there to support them are kind of doing, that's not our job, it's over there. So uh, families whose kids are threatening suicide, yeah. uh, I think there was a really interesting, very brave parent that came forward and wrote an article after the, the shooting in New York and said, I am Adam Lanza's mother about the perspective of I have a, I have a child like him and I worked really hard to try to get right. resources and supports for him. And the flack she took for writing that article was beyond awful. But she was very brave to do it. The, the situations of what the families are facing is really hard by the time they come to us. Um, taxes are a dirty word. I was going to say they're a four-letter word, but they're really a, that's five letters. Um, the tax base to support the public education system, it, it's it's an uphill, it's not even an uphill fight. It's like we just can't even get out of the ditch to, to get there. The other thing I really see is changing the landscape a lot is with charter schools, school vouchers, and school choice. Yeah. And while there's some amazing innovations that are occurring, in California anyway, the charter schools, they're called, it's called like the Wild West on how schools are, are implementing. And I also view that as a real threat to the foundation of public education and what that will mean. What it will mean not just for kids in special ed, but for every child. Yeah. The public school system is essentially being yeah. eroded right. with, with all of that. Um, and lastly, well, transition. Transition to adulthood. That very murky, cloudy area out there after the child is supposedly ready for adulthood and getting, you know, that's still, I know there's some areas that, is, that have done some amazing work, but employment, post, you know, po, you know, going on to higher education, that's still very um, difficult and challenging for, for families and youth. Um, the, the charter schools, mm -hmm. over, over identification and under identification mm -hmm. is still an issue. And then of course, we can't, we can't walk out of here without talking about the, the challenging behaviors. And I think positive behavior supports have made amazing, amazing inroads. I still keep going back to the fact that the, the behavior plans are as much, if not more, about the adults who are working with the kids than they are Absolutely. just for the child. So those yeah. are those are my. Uh, and I want to just sure. pop on her a couple of things. Um, I I think. Um, the electronic world, <laughs> the technology world, has also created families who actually have almost too much information. I think one of the things from the parent perspective that we end up having to do is help that family peel away and find what's really true. Uh, and, what, and what's true for them. What's true for them. What's, what's, what is true and what's true for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I admit that as the mother who did red dye in the 80s. I mean, you know, I bought that one. Um, but. <laughs> But um, it's, it's really a challenge um, for a new family. You know, in my day, um, you know, it took us forever to meet another family or to, uh, to connect with a, a group of families. And today they're connected in five minutes. Uh, they're connected online. And, and they're getting just, just an amazing amount of information, some true, some not true. And, um, and I think that that really, and, and I think that's also one of the things that is pushing the charter school movement, um, is that the the continuous information about this could be done differently here, this could be done differently there. And I'm not saying that parents, um, I, I I'm a I'm a reading wonk. I, I want to know everything, um, but I also know that one of our challenges is giving parents. Decim almost decision-making matrices to, to go look and see, you know, how you look at this and, and that running away from public ed may or may not be the solution, um, you know, uh, especially in, in our state where we have vouchers that you can go to any private school, even a church private school that has no certified teachers and no curriculum and use public money to, to go there uh, with your child having no rights. Um, 
So I think the whole information glut, glut is a, a really big thing. Yeah, so I want to just follow up a little bit, you, particularly with Connie and Nora, that you technologies and the Internet's an incredibly powerful t yeah. tool, and at the same time, it is a, it can be the wild, wild west. Right. Oh, yeah. And so how do you, and particularly with the, the technical assistance you provide, the centers that you work with, how do you make it a tool and useful to you and useful to the families you work with? Well, there's, there's two levels. One is the infrastructure within the parent centers that we work with, getting a database that isn't pencil and paper and file cabinets but and yes. being, being able, and yeah. there still are folks that do that, um, and, and um, being able to, to get reports and stuff out and right. phone systems and then, and then working with the centers to establish using um, technology to expand how trainings are able to be presented and accessed at any time and understanding that to have a webinar archive for the parent of the kid who, you know, she's up at two in the morning because the kid's not sleeping and they can get that information, but that it is not and never will be a substitute for the bodies in the room and the, and the, and the, the synergy that occurs when the, when the training, when, you know, when you're training live people and you can see their faces and judge their, their stuff. So there's the training piece. There's the, you know, most of the, many of the parent centers serve an entire state and rural remote and how you can access, you know, folks in, in communities that are not going to drive in for a training is, is really amazing and wonderful. But in, you know, in piggybacking on Connie's thing is also helping the centers help the families sift through and and learning um, discrimination skills as far as discriminating what you know how to judge is this website um, giving me good information evidence-based practice or whatever or is it is it you know am you know, is it dreck and um, the the technology that is available and it is still emerging I think is is a little bit of a discomfort, I think, for parent centers because we don't pay a lot. But one of the rewards we get is when we've worked with a family and can help a family. And to to remove that family space from you is mm -hmm. is um, is a hard thing. So the idea of having things more available online, yay. But it is, again, not the substitute for that person that's standing next to you. And, and I think our biggest challenge is uh, also not forgetting the large percentage of our families who don't either have access to good technology, although although actually the demographics show that that race and poverty do not totally drastically change the number of people who are operating on a smartphone. And so our big challenge is if in a lot of our communities, the only way to contact families is through the smartphone and me who does not tweet, <laughs> you know? uh, but it, it's that whole, uh, I mean, that whole, I guess, tension between our real mandate to be serving underserved families, uh, which the law says is what we do, um, and finding ways to address the needs of those families, whether they have literacy problems or they're in isolated parts of our states or they're in communities that don't automatically communicate well about education, uh, whatever, um, meeting their needs and then also being available for that family who really wants it on the website or, um, you know, wants to hear from us on a, a, a daily uh, tweet or a, a post on, on Facebook or whatever. Um, and it's, it's almost... Um, it almost divides us in two different programs. I mean, you know, we have to think, you know, how am I reaching my non, uh, even non-literate, that's not a word I think I just created, Spanish-speaking population with the same level of information that I'm giving my families who live in Chapel Hill. <laughs> you know? um, and I, I mean, and you have as many of those challenges as we do. So uh, it's it's really it's really a problem. And it, it um, and a lot of our um, our work in a lot of our states is the barriers that our not undocumented families have with school participation at all. It's not necessarily, uh, and we all are are having increased, um, I think, challenges with that. 
uh, it's hard to tell a parent to go to the IEP meeting when they can't go into the school because they don't have a state issued ID. Or, uh, or when the I, when someone from the IEP team says to that family, "Are you here legally?" Mm -hmm. with an implied threat. Yeah. You know, I want to go back for a minute to the question about the future, and uh, you know, I think that we face enormous fiscal challenges. I, uh, I'm only partially federally supported, and so I'll take off my federally supported hat and say that we absolutely have to bust the cap. You know, that, that as I start to look at what happens if Congress holds um, our national budget hostage um, for political infighting and other purposes, that the, the way that that will radiate out into our communities and into things that really matter to us um, will be profound. And I, I say that knowing that there are wildly varying opinions in this room about, about money and about taxation and about revenue. But I think that as the baby boom ages, uh, that what we're seeing is a growing population of people who don't understand how much their lives depend on a quality national public education system. And so I just, I think that um, I feel like we face a, an urgent situation in this country in terms of mobilizing around, uh, around letting people know what it is that really matters to us and uh, with first and foremost our kids. I think it's really important that we not allow our decisions to be made, especially based on the best interests of adults. Um, I, uh, I, I also, uh, as we think about technology and the problems of technology and, and how that may adversely affect the time that we get to sit down and talk with each other, there is a way that technology is incredibly mobilizing. And as we, um, it, it's a, it creates a possibility to bring people together with shared purpose. And I, I think about as we face the, um, so at some point, maybe, you know, maybe next year, maybe in two years, maybe 25 years from now, we'll get involved in reauthorizing IDEA. Um, and that, you know, I think that there's a real temptation uh, for us to essentially figure out what it is that we want, what it is that we need, and to speak perhaps um, in small groups of people and advance our own self-interest. And I really, as I look at what's happening nationally, I think mobilizing uh, uh, and creating coalitions where people really come together and agree to speak with a shared single voice just because what you stand to lose by isolating is, uh, is when compared to what you stand to gain by unifying. And I, I look at Connie and Nora and think about uh, they have two of the voices that were so unbelievably powerful 35 years ago, 40 years ago when the deals were getting struck. And I, I just hope that we can mobilize in the... Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, look at Nora's giving me the stink eye too. Yes, and back when yes, back when Nora was just a twinkle in her dad's oh, yeah. eye. Uh, you know the uh, um, the other thing about technology is that you know, I attended a fascinating presentation on robotics a couple of weeks ago, and you know the uh, the speaker said that it's going to be in the next couple of years possible to operate a fast food restaurant without there being a human being in it. That, um, that if you imagine that you walk into McDonald's and um, you're only going to interact with a machine that I takes your money. And, well, well, and that's, a, that's exactly where I was going, that as we think about transition, we think about what happens in school. Unemployment among people with disabilities is an absolute tragedy and the you know the great lie that many of our kids are taught many of our families are taught is that if you show up do the right thing go to your placements and so on that at some point you're going to have a piece of the american dream and the reality is instead that so many kids are sitting at home with nothing to do and if you look at the increasing complexity of the sorts of jobs we will have in five or ten years it becomes incumbent upon us to figure out you know how will we prepare this coming generation for the opportunities that will exist in the future. And, I, and, I, and, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, my whole thing that I have written down for the future is reauthorization. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a conversation about that in a second. But I want you to understand now, you've just seen a perfect example of generational differences. We are the 60s. We're doing funding, reauthorization, <laughs> you know. She's enough younger than ours that you're doing the nice people part. <laughs> oh, so I can be old and bitter too? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, Marsha. be a misread. I, I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
Okay. <laughs> you want me to do reauthorization, or you want to no, go forward? Hold on, just a sec. <laughs> okay. and, well, just and you know, Marshall and I had this discussion about uh, robotics and fast food places in the office, and I said. Well, that's great because we're going to need a lot of people to fix those robots. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. And so that's going to be a whole yeah. new industry that we can think about. And the other thing I want to say is uh, I think the last few days is really um, gives further evidence that there's nothing that um, substitutes for getting people in a room together. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've had we've we've uh, we've talked about the past and the present and some um, some some allusions to the future. So let's talk about the future a bit. What what is your outlook for the future? You've spoken a little bit about it. What are the opportunities and challenges that exist? And perhaps most importantly, since we have so much wisdom up here to my left, what thoughts, advice, or guidance would you offer to the next generation of leaders? I am going to go first. So, I knew she did. I am. So, I think there's a developmental model for developing parent leadership. I think that the first stage is the family who finds themselves having a kid with special needs, looks around, and gains information and resources about their child. And then the next stage after that is while they're learning about their child, they may learn more general information about that particular diagnosis or that particular situation. So that's sort of step two. And at some point, somebody comes to them because they think they may know a little bit more. This brand new family now is coming to this sort of second generation family saying, hey, I heard you had a kid with blah, blah, blah. How did you do that? And um, the second generation family says, well, I, I tried this. It might not be right for you, but this is what I knew. The next part of, of sort of the developmental model is making that leap from that diagnosis or situation to children and general disabilities and understanding that when it impacts my kid, it, it can be generalized or can be thought about that there's a whole, there's a whole um, lot of people out there with like me and making that leap to to the more generalized world of children with disabilities and then the final one is children in general so it's not every family does not go through sort of those four pieces um, everybody gets to the point where they get to and I think one of the critical pieces in that is the folks they meet along the way, and was there a mentor, and was there an opportunity that allowed them to gain some confidence and to gain some skills, and then want to take that that next step. So for that, I am always, always, um, always hopeful. I think that you know, looking at the future, the reauthorization, and with the um, ESEA Elementary Secondary Education Act, we're going to have a new president. I don't know who it's going to be. Hopefully somebody not with the blonde comb over. But um, <laughs> please. Or, or a bunch of us are moving to Canada. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but we, that, we, we can edit that out. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that there will be opportunities, but it's, it's like these two talked about building coalitions again and, and helping this generation of younger families understand the importance of building the coalitions and taking the time and patience to work through the differences to create that unified voice. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, is as an amazing challenge and opportunity for us to really shape and craft the future for our children. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about reauthorization a little bit because I actually am scared. Uh, and with her, where's Heather? Heather had them have been back in there. And I were two people who one time in our life were under a table in the Senate meeting room at a hearing, sending newsletters out to parents going, you won't believe what they're saying about our kids. Um, and I think that was 97 or 94, 97. It was 90, 94 didn't work. Yeah. And, um, and what we were hearing from from Congress about our kids, uh, which was not nice. Uh, same was in 97. Um, and similar, not quite as bad as 2004. Um, but there were some really different things back then. One, 
Uh, I think the parent organizations worked better together than they do now. Um, and there was a stronger, more unified voice of parents. Um, and the professional organizations were more, um, I think, communicative in a broader vein. I mean, okay, I'm a CEC member. I'm one of the teachers, you know, Council for Exceptional Children, and I have been forever, uh, even though they have not listened to me and I've been telling them there needs to be a parent division for 30 years. Um, but, you know, that group, that the membership of CEC is diminishing. Uh, and when things have worked in the future with legislation, it is because the parents and the educators were pushing in the same direction. Um, I'm not saying we will be pushing in different directions this time, but I think our communication methods to not only collaborate with our own constituencies and keep them educated, but also with each other are not as strong as, as they used to be. Um, and I also think that young parents who have never not had rights are not quite as clear about how important um, the rights are. Um, in some states, including the one I live in, if um, we did not have to educate kids with disabilities, I'm not quite sure we would uh, right now uh, with the current political situation. Uh, and I think our, our um, this coming reauthorization is going to be a really important one uh, to make sure that we not only get the good practices we have learned in the 20 years since they've reauthorized or whatever, you know, it's not quite that long, um, that we have the good practices in, but we have a floor of, of basic rights that the educators can depend on and we can depend on. Um, and I, I think we all are going to need to take the skills that we have learned from this meeting and other wonderful things that Cadre have taught, taught us and really start building bridges with folks when it, and being ready to make sure that as a group of people who care about individuals with disabilities and kids with disabilities, that we're communicating, we're collaborating. Um, and we are, are uh, coming up with a shared agenda based on all the skills you've taught us uh, in a way that it doesn't come like it had been a couple of times in the other ones that you had parents going, no, need this. We, we had educators going, need this. And um, uh, had, uh, we won't tell you, tell you what the school superintendents were saying. You all don't want to know that. <laughs> you know? But, I, I, but I do worry about that. I think we've, got, we've taken great strides. I think we have wonderful things going on in schools. We also have some bad things going on in schools, but that's, you know, um, but I, I, I do think as a, as a field, we have to look, uh, and I include parents in the field, um, that we have to look to be ready to, to be really collaborating and, and using all of our conflict resolution skills and our communication skills for a reauthorization that I hope happens before I die. <laughs> Me too. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent again. Uh, I've always been well served. I think that direction service has been well served by, uh, by sort of following the money. And, you know, if you take a look at spending in this country right now, um, education funding is kind of leveling out. Uh, in many places, it's declining. At the same time, we see this absolute rocket ship rise in, um, in health care spending. And, you know, uh, here in Oregon, we are leading the nation in terms of thinking about the integration of physical health, behavioral health, chemical dependency treatment, and dental care. We're really starting to think about how you fit all of that stuff together in a way that saves money and produces better outcomes. I think, though, that the reality is that insurance companies engage in a process called hot spotting, where they go and take a look and they figure out who their most expensive patients are, and then they provide them with an array of, of innovative approaches that, um, with, with an ultimate interest in containing costs, but also getting better outcomes. In fact, there's a bunch of people here in the room who are very involved in wraparound planning, which is just one of those very promising sorts of practices that begins to figure out how to weave things 
things together. I think that just looking at those four areas still ends up being a narrow definition of the problem, and that really the kids that we are working with in special education are oftentimes among the most expensive kids that insurance companies are dealing with. And as we talk about kind of breaking down silos and integrating vision, um, as we think about reauthorization, I think if we start to really get intentional about linking the work that we are doing in special education, linking the work that we're doing in conflict resolution and collaborative problem solving uh, to improved health outcomes, we create a new path and a new set of opportunities for ourselves that could be very, very important. You know, I, uh, I've said I, I'm not sure that I think that cracking um, IDEA open and beginning to monkey with it is going to serve us well. But I think that if we do, that if we try to figure out ways to build health in for our students, that we may acquire a group of, of influential supporters who wouldn't otherwise be there. Yeah. And do, so do any of you have any concluding remarks? So the Maasai tribes in Africa, their traditional greeting is not, hi, how you doing, or what's new, it's, and how are the children? That implies that the children are free from harm, that they have food, they have shelter, they have health, and that they are thriving. And I think that in our world, that also means that they have access to a quality education, that they have the capacity and the opportunities to to gain friendships and great social interactions and to look at a future where they can be a contributing member of our society. And I think all of those pieces have to be put in place so that if our greeting was, and how are the children, that someday I hold out this hope, someday we can say with all truth and with all honesty, all our children are doing well. And I and I hate to follow that, but I do want to, I do want to um, put it down to the level of one kid, real quickly. Michael Hawkins started school uh, in 1980. Our state law passed in 1978, and I, as I said early, or actually I hid him because I didn't know anything about special ed, and we were in a little country school, and they didn't know anything about it, and they were fine if he was in kindergarten, and who who cared if he didn't talk? You know, it was no big deal. Um, the the original diagnosis was he was probably going to stay fairly nonverbal. He had huge sensory integration issues. No high school diploma. Probably never going to ride a bike. Definitely wasn't going to swim. It's going to be pretty de independent. I mean, dependent upon mom and dad and whatever. Um, and we were blessed with um, an after we finally let people find him, which was sixth fifth grade. Um, we were blessed with four years of awesome regular special educator, regular educators in a building with only 200 kids who got individualized because he did it for everybody. And then we were blessed with a group of, of very, very good special educators and regular ed educators for the rest of his life. Now, I'm not going to tell you that it wasn't sometimes because they knew I was going to show up, <laughs> but I learned that good communication skills and a sense of humor got me a lot more than, than uh, being combative. Um, but he had truly a blend of really good regular ed and really good unique instruction and very good related services all the way through. Um, and uh, Michael Hawkins, who wasn't supposed to do any of that stuff, okay, uh, has a college degree. Took us a while, but we have one. And he has discovered that China cures his disability. And he's in his fifth, sixth month of working in China. Uh, because eye contact is rude in China. Uh, word retrieval problems aren't, uh, aren't an issue because they think he's being a very, very polite man. Uh, and at 6'5", he's bigger than anybody's seen in China, and they haven't figured out that he can't talk if he doesn't walk, and so it's fine. They're just looking at how big he is. Um, and and he, has ha he has an unbelievably good independent life, which on paper he should not have had. So all the children, but you did mine. <laughs> Um, 
Frank Zappa, who some of you will know, once said, and I just, I, I had to work him inside, but oh, yeah. who, who thought I was going to so call on Frank? Um, so, you know, Frank Zappa once said, do you love it? Do you hate it? There it is the way you made it. Wow. And, you know, I, I really think that uh, what's absolutely critical right now is for us to get politically involved, that, um, that we really, this is an enormous kind of a crossroads moment for our country. And uh, the decisions that are made in the next year or two, the people who are elected, who those people are listening to, will profoundly alter the course of this country. And that, um, and that we simply don't have the luxury of standing on the sidelines and watching other people figure it out. You know, as you go back to your states, and I certainly don't for a moment assume that all of you agree with us. I kind of think we agree with each other, but you know, there's always surprising uh, surprising discoveries, but I, I just really want to encourage you to create time in your life to get to know your elected officials, to work for and support the people that you want making important decisions for America, because we, I really do believe that we are going to, uh, we're going to make absolutely critical decisions in the next year or two. Um, that, uh, so please, uh, that would be my final piece, get politically involved. I'll make one final statement. None, none of the time of this panel was paid for by those federal dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that remark between, was nonpartisan. Between yeah. the two of us. And, <laughs> and all remarks are those of the people, <laughs> the people remarking that. them. Yes. <laughs> Remarkable. <laughs>